you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to open them to two places. The first, Revelation chapter 5, the last book in the Bible, fifth chapter. And when you found it, put your finger there and then turn back to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be reading out of both places, Revelation chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 6. On Sunday morning, we're in a sermon series called Q&A, questions and answers. You ask the questions about the Bible, and we'll let the Bible answer them. Today, angels and demons, are they real? And if they are real, what are they like? Not according to Hollywood, not according to Hallmark, not according to anyone or anything but the Bible. Angels and demons, are they real? Revelation 5, beginning with verse 11, the Apostle John writes about a worship service that will take place in heaven. I hope you'll be there. And in what he has to say, we see the angels are involved in worship. Then I looked, Revelation 5, verse 11, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne of God. The living creatures, the elders, and the total number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. Pastor, how much is that? That's a lot. And on top of that, thousands upon thousands. And they all said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. When you sing the Revelation song, you are singing Revelation chapter 5. Because that's the song of heaven. We warm up down here because that song will be sang up there. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. In Revelation 5, the angels are worshiping. But in Ephesians 6, we learn the demons are plotting. The demons are plotting. They're planning. They're preparing. For conflict. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, says the Apostle Paul, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Angels and demons. We live in a visible world. We can see everything that is around us. We live with visible people that likewise we can see. We call this realm the natural world. But as we are gathered here today in a visible place with visible people in the natural realm, I want you to know there is a supernatural realm as well. It's here too. And in this supernatural realm, places are invisible, at least invisible to us at this current time. And the beings who make up the supernatural world are likewise invisible. One day they will be visible, but not as of right now. So we have visible places and people, invisible places and people. One is the natural realm. We're going to talk about the supernatural realm. And those beings in the supernatural realm that we cannot see, but I promise you if we could put on spiritual glasses, they're here today. Those beings are called 
angels and demons. This morning we're going to learn about them. You're going to find out real quick they're real. If you did not believe it, you will today when you leave. They're real. And we're also going to find out some things about them that are very important. If we're going to have victory in the world that we live in. So let's begin by focusing on the angels. Seven facts about the angels of God. Those who wear the white hat. Those who are the heroes. The the godly angels. What does the Bible teach us about them? Now again, I don't care what Hollywood teaches because they're wrong. I don't care what's on the Hallmark car you receive because that might be wrong too. If you're going to ask a Bible question, it only makes sense to go to the Bible for the answers. Truth number one about godly angels. They were created by God. They didn't come out of any goo and become an angel. They didn't fall out of some monkey tree in glory and become an angel. Angels were created by God himself. God is a creator God, and He is Lord over everyone and everything He creates. And there came a time in distant past when God decided He wanted to have a relationship. He's a God of relationship, not a God of religion. And He wanted to have a relationship with beings that could interact with Him. And the Bible says He created angels. Later, he would create man. And the Bible teaches that every angel God created has a name. The devil numbers his people. And one day, if you follow the devil, your number's going to be up. But God names people. God names the angels. And God created the angels, and he named each and every one of them. And he gave them great intelligence. The angels are far, far superior intellectually than we are. And God gave them differing personalities. We have differing personalities. God gave the angelic host differing personalities. Some are happy all the time. Some are sad sacks and sourpusses, I guess. But but the angels have a personality. They have intelligence. And they have great power. Psalm 148 verse 5 says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He spoke the word and they were created. So the angels were created by God. All of them. Whether they be good ones or bad ones, God created them all in the beginning. Second truth. Angels are countless in number. You cannot count the stars in the sky. You cannot count the angels that are in heaven. We know that there's at least 100 million angels in heaven, give or take a few thousand. And Daniel, he talks about 10,000 times 10,000 when he talks about angels. John, in Revelation 5, we just read, talks about 10,000 times 10,000. So Daniel and John both say the same thing. But I believe John tries to one-up Daniel because he throws in, there's a few thousand over here and over there. So 100 million angels, at least, plus a few thousand here and there. Angels are countless in number. Thirdly, there's two angels in the Bible who were named by God and were told their names. The Bible does not mention any other angels by name, at least good angels, except these two. And these two that are named have a greater intelligence than all the other angels. 
They have greater power than all the other angels. They have a greater role. They have a greater responsibility. They have a greater duty to God, a greater devotion perhaps for God. And those two angels are not even called angels regular. They're called archangels. And there's only two of them. Gabriel, the archangel, who primarily is used by God to deliver messages to us. When God has a message, he wants us to hear. He does not entrust it to anyone but the archangel Gabriel. When Mary was giving, uh, going to have a baby, whom did God send to tell her? Gabriel. One of the greatest events in the history of the world. And God wasn't going to trust it to a regular angel. He wasn't even going to trust it to a prophet. He sent Gabriel the archangel to visit her and tell her what was about to unfold. So Gabriel is an archangel. And the Old Testament were introduced and later again in the New Testament to another angel who has a name. His name is Michael the archangel. And while Gabriel is a messenger angel bringing God's word to the human race when God wants them to hear it loudly and clearly, Michael is a warrior angel. Whenever God is going to combat, Michael leads the legions of angels in heaven in that combat, whether it be against an earthly foe or a demonic foe, a devilish foe, a hellish foe. So these two angels, Gabriel and Michael, they're archangels. Now there might be more. But we're not going to speculate on something we don't know for a fact. So we know, what have we learned? So angels are created by God. They're countless in number. There's two angels that are, whose names are taught to us and given to us. And they seem to have tremendous more intellect and power than all the other angels. And that's Gabriel and Michael. Fourthly, angels have the ability, at least temporarily to take on human form. Angels can appear as men. They can take on human form at times when they want to carry out special assignments for God. Hebrews 13 verse 2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I believe in the course of our life, this journey of life, this journey of faith that you and I are on, God allows us to intersect with angels. We don't most of the time even know it, but God sends them to perhaps take care of some confusion we're going through, meet a need, provide something for us to protect us from a danger that's coming. God does that out of his love for us. The angel does that out of his devotion to what God wants him to do. We don't know nothing about it. But they're there. If there was an angel seated here today, what would that angel say about the worship experience they had today with us? What would they go back to God and say? Lord, I came and I sat in the pew and nobody said a word to me. Nobody shook my hand. Nobody patted me on the back. Nobody invited me to come back tonight. That's why we teach you to greet. Because you never know that one-time visitor that you will see one time and never see again, you might see in heaven one day. And you'll say, wait a minute. You're an angel. You visited Miles Road on July the 9th, 2023. And I walked right by you, didn't I? Angels can appear as men. They can take on human form. And they carry out special assignments for the Lord. 
truth number five. Angels, when God created them, were created masculine in gender. Not neutral in gender. Certainly not feminine in gender. Angels were created masculine in gender. They are presented in the Bible always in a masculine, masculine pronoun way. There are no women angels. You ladies who get upset about that, see Keith. <laughs> Minister of complaints and music. That's Hollywood. There is no feminine angels. There's no women angels. None. And there's no baby angels. Hallmark likes to send out cards with those little fat chubby angel babies on it. It's not my favorite card to get, but some of you send them. But listen, there's no baby angels. When God created the angelic host, when he created them, he created them instantly with the word, he created them masculine in gender, and he created them fully, fully grown. So if somebody says to you they saw a woman angel or a baby angel, they're not, they're not seen correctly. Sixthly, angels were created by God for differing roles and responsibilities. We've already touched on that a little bit. When God gave these angels he created, gave them intelligence, he gave them power, he gave them personality. He gave them talents and gifts, perhaps, that match what he created them to do. God has a plan and purpose for you. God has a plan and purpose for the angels. God has a plan and purpose for everything he creates. And you'll never be happier than when you find that plan and purpose and you're right and dead in the middle of it. But the Bible says there's three kinds of angels that God created. Classes of angels who have different roles and responsibilities. We've already talked about the worship angels. They're given a name in the book of Isaiah. They're called seraphim. And these particular angels have wings. Not all angels have wings, but this particular group does. And they circle the throne of God. Isaiah was one of the few men who ever saw the throne of God. And in Isaiah 6, he says, I saw heaven opened up. I saw the throne. I saw God. I saw the Trinity. And I saw the angels wrapped around that throne. And they had a song. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is God the Father. Holy is God the Son. Holy is God the Spirit. The whole earth is filled with the glory of God. Revelation 5. Remember the worship scene we read about? Ten, excuse me, 10,000 times 10,000 or 100 million angels. All engaged in worship. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So there's worship angels. 24-7 worshiping him. Then there's work angels. These are the angels that oftentimes will take on human form. And they will carry out a special assignment for God in regard to us or to the church or to the world. The psalmist says, bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. One day we will look back in heaven and we will see God's hand was all over things that we were going through. We were going through confusion. We were going through instability. We didn't know what to do. And yet somebody came and gave us some good advice. And they never came back. We had a need. 
And somebody comes to our door and knocks on the door and hands us something and smiles and gives us a wave and disappears. A car's coming on you head on. Before that car is going to hit you and you're ready for the impact, all of a sudden it moves to the side. Luck, accident, chance, faith. The sovereignty of God using an angelic being perhaps to guide you, to provide for you, to protect you. Jesus in his humanity, remember when he went to the wilderness? Forty days he did not have anything to drink. Forty days he had nothing to eat. Forty days he faced the devil and his temptations. At the end of the forty days, God dispatched what? Angels. To minister to the humanity of Jesus Christ. They watered him and they fed him. Just like he does for us. In the garden of Gethsemane, in that garden, in the midst of the olive trees, Jesus began to weep. In his humanity, he began to weep because he saw the cross and what that was going to happen. And the Bible says he was so stressed, he was so up struggling with this that his capillaries in his forehead were busting and he was bleeding blood from his head. That was the stress he was under as he looked there. And the disciples, sound asleep. So God dispatched angels, it says, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And they strengthened him for the cross. So we know that these work angels minister to the Lord in his humanity. I tell you, they were minister to us. Then the third classification of angels is the warrior angels. They do God's battles for him. Now, I don't don't want you to misunderstand me. God doesn't need angels or us. He could take care of it all himself, but he doesn't. He chooses to have relationships with angels and use them. He chooses to have a relationship with us if we'll let him. And he uses us. But warrior angels. In Revelation 12, we read about a great battle that took place among the angelic beings in heaven. As Satan, who was the son of the morning, became Lucifer, the father of the night, he led a rebellion against God himself. Lucifer was the choir director of heaven. He led the worship of God in heaven. He was probably an archangel, but the Bible doesn't say that. And he decided he did not want to bring worship to God. He wanted to bring worship to himself. He said, I'm equal to God. Why do I have to give him worship? I want that worship. And so he deceived one-third of the angelic host and launched a civil war against God in heaven. This was long before there was any creation down here. And the good angels led by Michael defeated Lucifer and, and his angels called demons. So we know that Michael and the angelic angels have a military command and they fight continually with the demons of hell and the devil himself. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. The Israelites were outnumbered. They were outweaponed. They were outpositioned. It looked like the next morning they were going to be absolutely wiped out by the mightiest army of that day, the Assyrian army. And yet God's people did something that we don't do a whole lot of and should do as we look at what's happening in this country. They began to pray. And God heard their prayer and God sent an angel that night. One angel. And that angel went through the battlefield where the Assyrians were waiting to wage war the next day. 
And that one angel, 2 Kings 19, verse 35, slew 185,000 Assyrians in one night. And one night, that angel swept through that battleground. So when the sun came up the next day, there was 185 corpses on the ground. The buzzards eat well. And God's people were saved by one angel, military angel, dispatched by God. One more truth, and then we'll go to the demons and wrap this up. Angels of God are not God. Angels of God are not God. So if an angel speaks and an angel says something that contradicts the Bible, the Word of God, who's right? The Bible is always right. Say that. Bible is always right. Bible is always right. That's why you need to know your Bible. Because there's a lot of voices out there. There's a lot of chit-chat out there. There's a lot of rhetoric out there. There's a lot of propaganda out there. And none of it's biblical. Particularly on the subject of angels. Angels of God are not God. They do not contradict the living word or the written word, Jesus or the Bible. They, they do not bring new messages. God has said everything he wants to say and it's in the Bible. They don't bring change messages. They bring the truth as it is presented in the Bible. And if what they say doesn't match up with the Bible, you better let them go. Angels are not to be worshipped. Every time in the Bible an angel shows up to, to people, what do people do? They fall on their knees and try to worship him. And what does the angel say every time? Hey, how about get up? We worship God. You don't worship me. And I don't worship you. We worship Him. Angels are not to be prayed with. Or prayed for. Or prayed about. We pray to the Lord Jesus. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. For the sake of the Lord Jesus. We do not pray in the name of an angel. We don't pray through an angel. We don't pray for angels. We don't ask angels to pray for us. Angels are not to replace Jesus Christ. Now that's the angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Bible has said about the angels. But now in our time remaining, we've got to flip it a little bit. I want to give you some facts about the demons real quick. Because remember, in this world we cannot see the supernatural world. There's angels. If we could see right now, we would see there's angelic people in this place right now. And they're trying to keep you awake. That's not somebody tapping you on the back that's sitting behind you. They're trying to get you to listen. They're trying to get you to understand. They're trying to get you to respond. But there's also here demons. And they're here to make you go to sleep, doze off, hear only half of what you're going to hear, hear what you hear incorrectly. Demons are just like their master. Satan came to deceive and destroy. That's his modus operandi, and that's the demon's modus operandi. But let's go move quickly. Six facts on demons. We had seven on angels, six on demons. Demons are fallen angels who sided with Satan in the great heavenly civil war. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, Revelation 12. Let me say that again. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, Revelation 12 will tell you the story of that. Great civil war in heaven. Satan, with one-third of the angelic host, attacked God himself. 
Two-thirds of the angels sided with God, led by Michael. There was a massive warfare that took place in heaven. And God won. God always wins. And he booted Satan and the demons out of heaven. And they fell to earth. Revelation 12, 9. So demons were one time angels created by God for worship and work and warfare. Relationship. But Satan hijacked it. Got one third of the angelic realm to believe his lies. He's a master liar. And they sided with him and they took a terrible defeat. And now they've come to earth. Angry at God, but they can't touch God. So they're going to touch the thing that God loves the most. And that's you and I. Truth number two about demons, they primarily operate in the religious world. Not the political world, although I'm sure they're in Washington. Not in the entertainment world, but I'm sure they're in Hollywood. Not in the sports world. Primarily, they operate in the religious world. Because what does it matter if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? The demons don't care if you become president of the United States. They don't care if you become rich. They don't care if you become a Hall of Fame athlete. They don't care if you become a movie star. What would it profit a man if he could have all of that and yet he dies and goes into a Christless eternity? They operate in the religious realm because they want to take your soul from you. I want you to picture a stool here. And on that stool you have three legs. Those three legs represent the three things that the demons attack the most when they attack the Word of God. Because if you got a three-leg stool and you cut one leg out of a three-leg stool, what happens to the stool? It falls over. Just cutting one leg out causes it to fall. If you cut two out, it'll fall that much faster. If you cut them all, it'll stay on the ground. So Satan works in the religious realm. He works in pulpits just like this. He works in Sunday school podiums just like we have here. He works in the religious world. He works in the church world. He uses different people. And he uses these people to do his bidding, which is to bring great confusion about three things. Leg number one, Jesus Christ is Lord. Satan will tell you a lot of nice things about Jesus, but he will not tell you he's Lord. He'll also attack the Bible, the authority of the Bible. The Bible is true. Are you listening to me? The Bible is true theologically. It's true biologically. It's true anthropologically. It's true sociology. The Bible is always true. Always true. And yet he tries to undermine the truth of the Bible. Most of the time with silly nonsense to get people confused. He tries to confuse people about not only is Jesus Lord and the Bible authoritative, but he also tries to confuse people about the third leg of the wheel of the uh, chair. And that is salvation is by faith. Not by works. And yet so many people believe they're going to heaven. If you ask them why you're going to heaven, they'll say, because I said a prayer, I walked an aisle, I was baptized, I read my Bible, I do good deeds, I'm better than most people. Every one of those things are performance, and you will not go to heaven on your performance. You go to heaven by faith. And if you have the right faith, you'll have the right works to go with it. Satan and his demons attack in the religious world. They attack doctrine. They change it to confuse us, to deceive us, to destroy us. Thirdly, demons are like the devil. They're liars and they're murderers. 
They make promises they can't deliver. There is a way which seems right to people who don't know any better. But in the end, that way will lead to death. You think it's just coincidental that TV ministers come on and promise you all of these things? Particularly if you send money to their ministry. You want to you wanna have fortune and fame? You want to have pleasure and popularity? You want to have health? You want to have heaven down here? Believe what I tell you. Give me what I tell you to give me. Support me like you should. And I'll give you a kingdom down here. A kingdom down here. That's the kingdom that we want to be in. So demons are like the devil. They lie. They murder. They use people to do their bidding who lie and murder too. Fourthly, all demons can be put into two classifications. The demons who are free and the demons who are in prison. All demons are going to face the judgment of Jesus Christ one day. But there are a large group of demons right now that are called free demons. They're on the loose. They're deceiving. They're destroying. They're involved in every realm of life and society as we know it. They're preparing the world for the coming of Antichrist, Satan, Superman. They're preparing the world for the false prophet, the greatest liar this world has ever seen, who's a religious figure. They're, they're out there preparing the world for the new world order. God hasn't judged them yet. They're going to be judged. But their time hasn't come yet. They're called free because they, they can go wherever they want. But there is a group of demons that cannot go anywhere. They've been put in prison. Hell is a prison. And they've been put in that prison. Why? Because they violated laws that God gave them that told them not to violate. And they didn't listen to God. And those laws that God told them not to violate dealt with sexuality. And for breaking that law of God. God has put them in prison. They're locked away on death row. 2 Peter 2 verse 4. If God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of a gloomy darkness, and there they will stay until the judgment. Wow. Just coincidental, in the tribulation period, the last seven years of history and for this world, Satan will be given a key. That key will be given to him by the Lord. That key opens up the prison of hell. And Satan will take that key and go down to that prison and open up the prison doors. And all of these imprisoned demons, horrible demons will be let loose. The Bible talks about that in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 9. Fifthly, time is about out. Demons can possess humans, just like Jesus Christ can possess us, who are believers. Let me ask you a question. If you want to be saved, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I want to be saved. Pastor, would you save me? What's wrong with that? I can't save you. Who saves you? Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in order to be saved, you have to actively ask him to come into your life and save you. He doesn't just randomly pick people out and say, Sir, I know you didn't ask me to save you, but I'm going to save you anyway. <clears throat> say yes. 
Salvation is always by personal invitation of you and I to Him. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Without you inviting Him to come in, He will not come in. You got that? The demons can't just pick out people and possess them. And by the way, demonic possession is real. Demonic possession is very real. And you go to third world countries where Scott has been, others of you have been, Norman, Fortier, others, you will see it much more than you see it in America. We kind of disguise it and hide it and camouflage it a little bit in, quote, civilized countries. But you see the rawness of it when you go to third world countries. So there is demonic possession. And these demons, they just can't randomly just pick out people. You know how they are able to get into somebody's life? Control their mind, their heart, their eternal soul? It's because we invite them to come in. You say, Pastor, what, what fool would invite a demon into his life? Well, it's not necessarily demon come in. It's by engaging in things that opens the spiritual door where they can come in. If I leave my front door of my house open every night for the rest of this year, you may not come in. But you could if you wanted to. Right? If the front door of my house is left open, I'm not going to lock that door. I may get through July, August, September, October, November, December. Nobody will ever bother my house. The door's open. They could come in, but they don't. But they could. And when you start opening up spiritual doorways from this realm to that realm, Demons can come in. They may not come in, and you might walk around and say, well, I got, I, it ain't bother me. They can come anytime they want to. You say, what are those doorways, Pastor? Witchcraft, astrology, horoscopes, black magic, seances, psychics, paranormal encounters, sexual perversion, intoxicants, hypnosis, the list goes on and on and on. When you participate in these things, you need to be careful because you're opening up the door and a demon could come in. If he so chooses, he may never come in. Keep the door closed. Keep it locked. Or you might get a visitation you don't like. Lastly, one day the demons are going to be utterly defeated along with the devil. Amen. We win. We win. Say, Pastor, I'm on the devil's side. You lose. I've got an army of demons with me. You lose. Because in Revelation 19, John closes out the book of Revelation, or close to it, by telling us of the final battle that will take place in the Valley of Megiddo, the final battle of the War of Armageddon. Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, demons, and every ungodly person in this world will all be there to stop the coming of Jesus. Jesus will come. He will come with the holy angels. He'll come with the redeemed saints. He'll come on a white horse, and we'll ride a white horse right behind him. And there will be a battle there. And the Bible says the battle will go on for seven days. The Bible says we'll outgun the devil. The Bible says Jesus will speak the word. It's over. One day, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is coming. And he'll take care of old Slewfoot and all those who choose to follow him, demonic or human. 
I close by asking you a question. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Because you can hide it from me, hide it from Sam, hide it from each other. But whose side are you on? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.